Now let's talk about Einstein's masterwork, general relativity. We start with the equivalence principle. In general relativity, it's framed around the idea that the gravitational and inertial masses of an object are identical. Einstein said there's no way to distinguish between a change in an object's motion caused by gravity and a change in motion caused by any other force. In other words, he's making gravity nothing special. It's just one way to cause the change in motion or acceleration of an object, where there are other ways, and we don't declare gravity to be particular in any way. This premise amazingly led him to a new geometric theory of gravity in which mass energy causes the curvature of space-time. Einstein was struck by the coincidence, just stated, that the inertial mass, which remembers the resistance of an object to a change in its motion, is identical to the gravitational mass, its change in motion due to the gravity force. In this pair of situations, on the left we have someone in a rocket ship that's accelerating through space at 9.8 meters per second per second. And if, in this sealed situation, they don't know where they are, they would see objects behaving as they would on the surface of the Earth. An apple would fall from their hand, and any experiment they did in that enclosed space would tell them nothing that was not like their normal situation on the Earth. So to them, it's identical to the situation on the right of being in a little sealed room where they do an experiment and see objects falling with acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second. But on the left, the acceleration is a rocket ship moving through the vacuum of space, whereas on the right, the acceleration is the gravity of the Earth. Clearly, fundamentally different situations, and yet to the observer, there's no way to distinguish them. Einstein also imagined a second pair of situations. On the one on the right, an astronaut is floating in a spaceship in deep space far from any object. He's weightless. The rocket ship is weightless, and the astronaut is weightless, and the astronaut floats within the spaceship, a fairly benign situation. On the left, a dramatically different situation. The person is in an elevator where the cable is broken, and the elevator is plunging to the Earth's surface, and the person is plunging to their death. For that time, the person would float within the elevator, apparently weightless, because both the elevator and the person are accelerating towards the Earth at 9.8 meters per second per second. Again, vastly different situations in their implication. The one on the right, no gravity is involved, it's deep space. The one on the left, the gravity of the Earth is involved. This is a little morbid, but Einstein called this the happiest thought of his life. He said there's no way to distinguish between free-floating in deep space and free-falling gravity and there's no way to distinguish between acceleration upward and being stationary in gravity. There's nothing special about gravity in this case. And so general relativity generalizes the idea of change in motion, such that gravity is just one of the reasons why an object can change its motion. And we have to attribute these effects to space-time itself. And that's the idea of general relativity. We won't get too mathematical, but here are Einstein's field equations. This is the math with which he solved the problem. Einstein was not actually a brilliant mathematician. Some of the other physicists working this subject actually helped him along, and he in particular got help from Gauss, Riemann, and Hilbert, brilliant mathematicians in their own right. It took him eight years of struggling with the math to make his theory work, even though he had the physical ideas easily and readily. He had to reach back into foundational 19th century work on curved space to formulate the theory of general relativity. Interestingly, Russian and German mathematicians in the mid-19th century had worked out the mathematics of curved space and of multi-dimensional space-times involving more than three or four dimensions. It was just general and beautiful math. Einstein plucked this math from the 19th century and applied it to a new physical theory of gravity. His theory promotes space-time from a static scaffolding, as in Newton's idea, to an active participant. In the famous words of John Archibald Wheeler, a younger physicist, a generation below Einstein, mass and energy tell space how to curve, and space tells mass and energy how to move. The equation you see here is a compact form of the general relativity math that equates 
curvature of space-time to mass energy density. It unpacks into 10 partial second-order differential equations, enough to give most physics graduate students cold sweats. I had to learn it myself a long time ago. But we don't need to know the math to see how this theory works. Mass energy curves space-time, and we can visualize it as seen in the little animations on the right. What about testing the theory? Arthur Eddington reported an immediate successful experiment of the deflection of light by observing a 1919 solar eclipse and an expedition to Principe off, Grin off Guinea. Now remember, the theory had only been published in 1916. Remember also that the world had just emerged from the First War, a terrible time with the loss of tens of millions of lives. This was popularized by Eddington as a triumphant confirmation of Einstein's work, and Eddington went on to become one of general relativity's most important boosters. You can see on the left the headline from the New York Times using somewhat quaint, archaic language. This was a profound experiment. It happened very quickly to confirm his theory, within three years. It was considered pivotal and a foundational moment that an English astrophysicist would confirm the theory of a German scientist just one year after the two countries emerged from a brutal and bitter four-year war was perhaps a sign of the fact that science went beyond politics and it could unify people. So people took this as an optimistic message. Beyond that, it elevated Einstein's reputation enormously. The second phenomenon that occurred there was an explanation that Einstein had been seeking as he developed the theory was what's called the perihelion precession of Mercury. In the animation above, you see that Mercury orbits the Sun and the position of its closest approach and furthest approach does not change as the orbit progresses, the elliptical orbit. But under general relativity, because of the curvature of space-time, you can see that the ellipse of Mercury's orbit precesses so the position of closest approach and furthest approach, the perihelion, advances or changes over time. It's a very small effect. The difference between the Newtonian prediction and the general relativity prediction is a difference of only 43 arc seconds per century. That's half an arc second per year, a very small amount for astronomers to measure out of 574 arc seconds. But it's a real difference that could be measured and was measured. And Einstein showed that general relativity predicted exactly the additional amount of precession that was observed, and so solved this long-standing problem. The defection of light is a key part of general relativity, and we can imagine it in another thought experiment. Imagine in an elevator you shine a beam of light across the elevator. If the elevator is not moving, the beam of light obviously goes to a point across from where you shone the light. If the elevator is in constant motion, the beam of light is, hits a point on the lower wall below by an angle which you can see is simple vectors. If the beam of light is accelerating, it hits an even lower point on the wall. So this is intuitively obvious. If you shine a beam of light as an outside observer and the elevator is moving, the beam of light will hit a different part of the far wall. And so its path is curved as seen by the observer in the elevator. But we've just said that there's no difference between someone standing on the Earth's surface feeling their own gravity and an elevator, for example, or a rocket accelerating upwards at the same 9.8 meters per second per second. So logically, a person standing on the Earth's surface feeling their own gravity would have an observer see a deflecting light beam across the elevator. And that, in fact, is what happens. That's the gravitational deflection of light the gravitational bending of light on the Earth caused by the Earth's gravity. This effect is seen. It's very small, of course, was hard to detect until the last few centuries, but once again is an example of space-time being bent by mass energy. So light follows curved space, and we have seen now in astronomy dramatic examples of this. Uh, the schema on the right is a situation where the Earth is looking past a giant cluster of galaxies at a distance of a few billion light years towards a very distant galaxy, perhaps five or ten billion light years away. And the light from the distant galaxy can come straight to the Earth through the center of the cluster, but it can also reach the Earth by taking bent trajectories around the edge of the cluster. 
In other words, the cluster acts like a lens, just as an optical lens would work, but this is a lens of mass. And that, just with a lens, an optical lens, creates distortion of light, creates magnification, and creates deflection of the light rays as they pass through space. And these effects have been seen many times. Here's a beautiful example from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a real astronomical image taken about 10 years ago. And you can see in the center of the frame is a massive galaxy and a large cluster of galaxies across the frame. And if you look, you can see at the periphery of the image are the concentric arcs or small sheared out images of more distant galaxies. Those shearing effects, those concentric circles and miniature arcs of galaxies are normal shaped galaxies who've been distorted and amplified and had their light bent around the cluster to reach the telescope that made the image. A beautiful example of gravitational lensing. Hubble Space Telescope has actually taken hundreds of such pictures now. It's quite a routine phenomenon for astronomers to observe. Another phenomenon that was observed in the 1950s, two phenomena actually, that are predicted by general relativity, are the fact that clocks will run slower in strong gravity. This is the time dilation of general relativity. Now, we can't go to an extreme gravity situation, but you don't actually need to. In principle, the gravity above the Earth's surface is slightly less than the gravity on the Earth's surface. This diagram shows how the experiment might be done right now. But it was first done in the 1950s using atomic clocks that had just been developed, where one clock would be kept on the ground and a second identical atomic clock would be flown in a high-flying spy plane, a U-2 plane, for example, at 50 or 60,000 feet elevation. And then they would be brought back down and compared. After some time, some hours, or maybe even days of travel, the clock that had been traveling at high altitude kept very slightly faster time than the clock that was on the Earth's surface in slightly stronger gravity. So this amazingly small change has been detected. Now the experiment actually seen on the left where this can be done in a building can now be done. In fact, it's possible with the most accurate optical switch clocks to see gravity operating at a different speed with distances of one meter vertically apart in the lab because time can be measured accurate to one part in 10 billion billion. So the precision of our clocks allow us to show that a clock does tick very slightly slower in stronger gravity. As we'll see, in the extreme gravity of something like a black hole, this effect becomes more than subtle. It becomes extreme. Another prediction was the gravitational redshift. We can imagine that a photon has to struggle to escape the energy or the Earth's gravitational field. And this mathematically turns into a redshift. So as a light wave climbs in a gravitational field, its frequency decreases and its wavelength increases, which is reddening of light. This gravitational redshift, again, on the Earth's surface, a very, very subtle effect, just one part in a billion billion, was detected also in the 1960s and now has been seen in space and in astronomy routinely. So these two key predictions of general relativity were confirmed almost half a century ago. Let's look at Newton's gravity. Now compare this with Einstein's gravity, where the bending of space-time and the twisting of the Earth 
torques the contours of space-time and creates two distinct effects that might be observable. The experiment you see here in animation form is called Gravity Probe B. It was an experiment conceived in the 1980s, carried out in the 1990s, and took 15 years to publish. But both a gyroscope and an orbiting satellite, both effects of general relativity were detected. That is to say, the bending of space-time, and so the deviation of the orientation of the very subtle gyroscopic effect, and the twisting of the contours, the so-called geodetic effect. Both of these were new affirmations of general relativity in a new regime. Again, using the quite modest gravity of the Earth, these effects would be much stronger and more obvious uh, using larger gravity, such as a black hole. And that's the end of this topic.